So let's move on to the topic of graphical models. Um, graphical models uh, are one of these hugely influential ideas in machine learning. If you open any machine learning conference paper or journal, uh, chances are pretty good that you might find a picture of a graphical model somewhere in there. So um, this wasn't certainly the case 15 or 20 years ago, so something major has happened in the field and lots of people are using graphical models. So in this lecture what I'll try to do is explain to you the basics of graphical models, the fundamentals of graphical models, and then maybe uh, mention some more advanced topics as well. So uh, just again for my knowledge, Raise your hand if you've studied graphical models in some form in the past. Okay, a few people. All right, that's good. Okay, so um, what's the basic idea? The basic idea is that we're trying to represent knowledge in a graphical form. Uh, what I mean by that is that we're going to represent models where the models have some uh, variables in them through a graph and in this graph the nodes are going to correspond to uh, those variables and the edges are going to represent the statistical dependencies between those variables. Okay? So for example, imagine you were, um, you know, Imagine you're a nuclear engineer and you have a model of a nuclear power plant and um, in that nuclear power plant there are hundreds of sensors of different kinds and so on and there are some variables that are very important like the state of the core of the nuclear power plant and now not all those variables depend directly on the other variables so you might want to represent your knowledge about that nuclear power plant by thinking of every one of your sensors and which other variables it might depend on and which hidden variables there are and so on. Now once you have a representation of your knowledge in that graphical form, then you can start asking questions. Like for example, if the pressure at this valve is this value and the temperature is uh, this value here and this value here, um, what is the probability that you have a uh, meltdown in your, the core of your nuclear power plant. Okay, that's the kind of question you might be interested in answering um, uh, given your model. So that's the basic idea of graphical model. Um, so why do we need graphical models? You know, um, sometimes I've spoken to statisticians and they'll say, I don't need the graph, you just show me the equations. You know, what's the graph? doing for me? Um, well, uh, you know, not everybody would agree. Um, first of all, graphs are very intuitive. So they're a nice way of visualizing relationships between variables. And we use graphs all the time. Like for example, you know, if you want to talk about your family tree, you represent that as a, some sort of um, graphical structure as a tree. Uh, if you're drawing a circuit diagram, we don't even think about it, we draw it as a graph, right? So graphs are used by lots of people in lots of different contexts. Importantly, graphs allow us to abstract um, the dependencies between the variables. This concept of conditional independence, which I'll talk about in a minute, it allows us to abstract that from the details of the equations. So when I look at this graph, I can say C depends on A and B. I don't even have to tell you that A is real and B is binary and C is a discrete variable and this dependency has this equation form. I'm just saying C depends on A and B. That's all I'm representing. So it's a nice way of abstracting um, these dependency relationships. And uh, we can answer interesting questions of the following kind. For example, is A dependent on B given that we know the value of C just by looking at the graph without having to know anything about the equations. And finally, um, a really important uh, reason to use graphical models is that they allow us to define 
general message passing algorithms on the graph that implement probabilistic computations efficiently. So for example, we can answer the question, what is the probability of some variable A, given that variable C takes on some value little c, just by sending messages in the graph without actually having to write out the joint probability of all of the variables. Okay. So graphical models have been really successful. Um, and in some sense, they, they bring together three very interesting fields. Statistics, graph theory, a very little basic bit of graph theory, and computer science, because we can now implement algorithms on the graphs, sending messages on the graphs. Okay. So um, there are several different kinds of graphs. Um, one uh, kind of graph that uh, is very widely used is the directed graph, sometimes called the directed acyclic graph, sometimes called the Bayesian network, which is not a very good name for it because it doesn't actually, uh, you know, you, can, you don't have to do Bayesian inference with Bayesian uh, networks. Sometimes called the belief network, um, so it has different names. Uh, but let's just call it a directed graphical model, okay? So uh, a directed graphical model like this one I've shown here has uh, arrows that are directed and what we think of the um, arrows pointing at children from their parents. So A and B are parents of C. And similarly, um, you know, we can generalize this concept to ancestors. So A is an ancestor of E, and um, E is a descendant of A. All right? Now, what does this directed graph correspond to? Well, it corresponds to a factorization of the joint probability distribution. So when I write this directed graph here, what I mean is that the joint distribution of all of these variables factors in the following way. It's the probability of A times the probability of B times the probability of C given A and B times D given B and C and then E given C and D. So what I've actually done is stated that the joint distribution of all of my variables in general factors into the product of the distribution of each variable given its parents. Okay, the variable xi given the, the parents of node i. Okay? And that's going to be quite interesting actually. When we write a graph like that, it corresponds to a factorization of the joint distribution. That's all it is saying. It's not saying anything about the, the statistical um, forms of these dependencies. And uh, one of the reasons this kind of graph is going to be interesting is, I'll talk about at the very end of this lecture, is that it's usually a nice way of representing causal relationships. Okay? So, for example, um, you know, rain causes the ground to be wet, right? And then the ground being wet might cause somebody to slip. So rain causes somebody to slip indirectly through the ground being wet. And the direction of the arrow goes that way, not the other way. The ground being wet doesn't cause rain. You know, not in any simple way. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it does. I don't know. All right. Okay, so that's the basic uh, causal direction, but for now, don't think about causality. Just think about um, a statement about the joint distribution of a bunch of variables. Okay, so um, this uh, statement about the joint distribution of the variables corresponds to uh, some statements about conditional independence. So actually, um, 
what we're interested in is uh, figuring out whether some set of variables x are, or let's just take one variable, if some variable x is independent of some variable y given some set of variables v. Okay? So, um, you know, uh, I'll give an example here. Let's say uh, you uh, are considering um, driving uh, speeding tickets. So you, if you have a Ferrari, okay, this is the variable saying the car is a Ferrari or not, then um, this might be a variable that says how fast you're going, and then this might be a variable that says what is the amount of of the fine that you get for speeding, for going too fast, okay? So um, clearly how fast you go depends on what kind of car you drive and how much of a speeding ticket you get corresponds to how, uh, depends on how fast you go, okay? But, you know, in a, in a reasonable society, the the size of the ticket that you get on, only depends on the, um, how fast you were going. It doesn't depend on how expensive your car was. Okay, although in some countries, um, there's some more complicated uh, relationships. So I, somewhere in Scandinavia, I think the amount of your speeding ticket depends on your income, which is a very interesting concept, but anyway. So we're interested in general in uh, conditional independence statements and this symbol um, here is a symbol that m uh, means independent. So x is independent of y. Okay. And um, this, when we write like this, this means conditionally independent. Um, so, let's think about the speeding example again. Um, the, uh, the price of the ticket that you get is not independent of um, whether you're driving a Ferrari or not, right? So, it's not the case that X is independent of Y because it tends to be that Ferrari drivers will drive faster and get bigger tickets. Okay, but um, you know, if you were to consider the price of the ticket, you should be independent of whether you're driving a Ferrari or not, a condition on the speed that you were caught driving. Okay, so this is the difference between conditional independence and just marginal independence. Okay. Um, so, independence is, uh, is an interesting concept, it's an important concept, but conditional independence is a much more powerful concept because usually two things might be independent, um, but then when you condition on something else, they become dependent, or the other way around. You know, they might be dependent, like, like in that situation, but when you condition on something else, they might become independent. Okay. Um, So, uh, when you have a graph like this, you can use this graph to read out uh, whether variables are conditionally independent or not given some other set of variables. And the rules for doing that um, are something called de-separation, which is a little bit complicated. I'm not going to go through it. I've written out the rules here. And it depends on um, some property of all the, gr all the paths between pairs of nodes. Okay, so um, x is independent of y given v if the set v de-separates or separates x from y. Okay, these are the rules for, um, d, d stands for dependency. So it, uh, these are the rules for, 
uh, determining whether a set of variables dependency separates two other sets of variables. But here is an interesting corollary of these rules, which is um, this concept of a Markov boundary for a variable x. A variable x is independent of all other variables given its parents, its children, and the parents of its children. So um, let me draw a couple of examples here. So if we have a graph like this, Okay. This is a, some graphical model. Now we can start asking questions. Um, for example, uh, is A independent of E given C? What do you think? Is A independent of is independent of E given C. Who thinks yes? Yeah, it's actually uh, you know the uh, the this is uh, you probably haven't parsed all of that, but basically um, you know all the paths from A to E go through C, and C is blocking the relationship between A and E. And, and similarly, A is independent of F given C. Okay, so the answer here is yes. Um, now, is, uh, is A independent of E? No. Clearly, A and E are not independent because they, you know, there's some dependency, there's some path going from A to E. Um, and we can ask other questions. Is uh, D independent of F? No. D is not going to be independent of F because C influences both D and F. Okay. Um, but D and F are independent given C. All right. These are some examples. Of course, the situation can get much more complicated. Um, you know, if you have an edge like that, and now I can say, well, uh, you know, is E independent of A given C? And I mean, even I would have to think about it a little bit. Is E independent of A given C? I think so, but I'd have to look at the rules. Okay. But the point is there are rules. So um, here's the beautiful, it's sort of like a, you know, a, an interesting theorem about the, this directed graphical model. If my distribution factorizes according to the equations I had on the previous slide, this product of children given their parents, then I can just look at this graph and determine What's independent of what given what? Okay? And this has computational implications because then when I'm trying to do computations with the particular graph, then um, you know, there's parts of the graph I can ignore. So it, my computations become much more efficient. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, so um, these are directed graphs. Uh, let me see if I don't think I have slides for undirected graphs, but because undirected graphs are becoming popular again for some interesting reasons, uh, I'm going to talk to you about undirected graphs as well. I'll just mention them on the board. 
um, in an undirected graph, uh, our edges don't have uh, directions to their arrows. So my undirected graph might look like this, for example. And this undirected graph corresponds to a particular factorization of the joint distribution as well, just like the directed graph. But the factorization of the joint distribution here involves looking at all of the, um, what's called the cliques. These are fully connected subgraphs. So this is one clique, this is another clique, this is another clique, this is another clique. And um, then saying that the joint probability of all of these variables is the product of uh, non-negative functions on these cliques renormalized. So just to be very precise here, the joint probability of A, B, C, D, E, F in this particular case can be written as uh, some function phi 1 of a b, some function uh, phi 2 of b c, some function phi 3 of a d, and some function phi 4 of e d f. And then there's some normalizing constant. Uh, to make sure the product of these non-negative functions, when we sum over a, b, c, d, e, and f, um, integrates or sums to one. Okay. Um, yes. So here, uh, I would this graph corresponds to this subgraph here would involve a factor over these three variables, not three factors over the pairs of variables. Okay. Um, this, uh, the conditional independence relationships for an undirected graph, this, these are undirected graphs, are very, very simple. Um, every node is independent of all the other nodes given its neighbors. Okay, so for example, D is independent of B and C given A, E, and F because those are the neighbors of D. All right. Um, so really, you can think of this almost like um, imagine you have a communication network between people, the and these are the only ways people can communicate. So what D knows is independent of what B and C know given what it's heard through A, E, and F. Okay, it's isolated. This is the Markov blanket isolates you from the rest of the variables. So why am I mentioning undirected graphs? Undirected graphs are very old and um, they're being used quite a lot these days. Um, they're coming back in popularity because a whole bunch of different things, for example, Markov random fields in computer vision, or conditional <laughs> random fields, also in computer vision and um, language processing, for example, are examples of undirected graphical models. Things like the restricted Boltzmann machine. is just an undirected graphical model, um, etc. There are many different undirected graphical models that people use these days. Okay. All right. So that's um, directed and undirected graphical models. Okay. Um, now, if you write down a statistical model, uh, then uh, that also often corresponds to expressing some sort of graphical model. So consider this very simple situation. 
where I have a set of n data points generated independently and identically from a Gaussian. This is a, a verbal description of my model. It generated independently and identically from a Gaussian with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. Okay? That verbal description of a model corresponds to essentially some sort of statement like the joint distribution of my n uh, data points, mu and sigma, factors into um, some statement about what values mu and sigma can take. So for example, I haven't really said whether the prior on mu and sigma is um, independent or not, but if we assume they're independent, then we get a distribution over mu, a distribution over sigma, and then this IID statement says that the probability distribution over xn given mu and sigma is one of n big n terms that get multiplied together here. So that's, that product here comes from the independence uh, assumption. Okay? And we can represent this joint distribution graphically by just drawing a graph that looks like this. You have mu and sigma, and then x1 through xn depend on mu and sigma. But then to make your notation a little bit more convenient, um, people in graphical models have invented this concept of a plate. And plate looks like this. And the variable xn gets repeated big n times inside this plate. So this graph is equivalent to this picture here. Okay? And you will often see in papers graphs that look like this with plates in them because variables get repeated. You know, you have one variable per data point, etc. Right? You know, for the observations. Okay. So that's plates, and that just corresponds to particular graphical model notations. So now, let's, what do you do with graphical models? Let's talk about the problem of inference with a graphical model. So inference corresponds to uh, evaluating the probability distribution over some set of variables given the values of another set of variables. Okay? So for example, if I have a graph that looks like that, which represents that factorization, how can we compute the probability distribution over variable A given that we know the value of variable C? And assume each variable is binary. So here is a naive method for doing it. Um, probability of A, and, you compute the probability of A and C by summing over B, D, and E. Okay? So that corresponds to computing 16 terms because if all the variables are binary, this sum includes 2 times 2 times 2, so that's 8 terms in here, right? But we have to compute this twice because A can have two different values, 0 and 1. So 2 times 8 is 16 terms. And now it, once I have this, I can sum out the variable A to get P of C equals big C. That's two terms. And then I divide this by this to get the probability of A given C. So that's, again, two divisions that I have to do. Okay. So the naive method involved doing 20 computations. I mean, you can define computation in a different way, additions, multiplications, divisions, and so on. But you know, simply speaking, I've computed 20 different quantities here. Okay. Can we do this more efficiently? Well, we're only interested in the distribution over a and C, right? But we're doing all these computations and all these other variables. Let's see if we can do this a little bit more efficiently. So here is a more efficient method. Um, here's the probability of A uh, and C. We're summing over B, D, and E, but let's plug in our graphical model representation. Let's plug in the fact that we know that our joint distribution factors in a particular way. Okay? So we've just plugged that in. And everywhere where I saw C, 
I've replaced c with its value c equals little c. Okay? So now um, we haven't done anything. Now we can notice something. So notice that the variable e doesn't appear anywhere except in the last term. So I can bring this sum over e. This is a triple sum over b, d, and e. I can bring one of those sums in all the way here. So that's the sum over e of p of e given c and d. Okay. Now, let's notice something else interesting. Uh, the sum over some variable of that variable is always 1. Okay. So this term is always 1. So that just cancels. Similarly, we can bring the sum over d all the way in here, and this sum is always 1. Okay, so that cancels as well. So what we're left with is this expression here, and now we're only summing over b. Okay? We don't have to sum over d and e. And if you look at the graph, that's interesting. Uh, we're interested in the relationship between a and c, it turns out that the variables d and e are irrelevant. We can sum them out, and we don't have to compute anything having to do with them, but we do have to compute the different choices of b. Um, and then this expression has only four terms in it, so now to do the same computation we have four terms plus two terms and two terms for these two computations before. So instead of 20 terms, now we only have to compute eight terms. Now that seems, you know, um, modest gains from 20, we went to 8, so what's the big deal? Well, the point is that uh, in general for larger graphs, if you use the conditional independence relationships, you can get exponential gains in efficiency. Okay? If I have n variables and they're binary, they're 2 to the n possible states. And I don't want to have to sum over 2 to the n states. If my graph is simple, if it's, for example, tree structured, I can do that computation order n instead of order 2 to the n. That's an exponential gain in efficiency. That's where the power of um, graphical models really comes in. Okay. Um, so, uh, instead of working with directed graphs or undirected graphs, we're actually going to work with a, another representation called a factor graph. And a factor graph is just, um, it's almost like an undirected graph, but it's a little bit more detailed a representation. And it's much more computationally and algorithmically easy to work with factor graphs than to work with um, directed and undirected graphs. So a factor graph just says the joint distribution of uh, all my variables, let's call them bold x, this vector of variables, if it factors in a particular way, then we can just say it's the product of functions of subsets of variables. Okay? So this graph, for example, corresponds to uh, a function f1 over x1 and x2, a function f2 over x2 and x3, and a function f3 over x2 and x4. Okay? Does that make sense? So um, that's a factor graph representation of this joint distribution. And there are um, certain graphs that are called singly connected graphs, where the underlying factor graph looks like a tree, and then there are things called multiply connected graphs which have loops in them. Okay, so here is a, a loop, all right? And um, for now, let's just concentrate on these simpler things, the singly connected factor graphs. And what we're going to uh, describe is a general method for uh, computing on these factor graphs on these singly connected factor graphs by passing messages on the graph. Okay, so this is just the description of a factor graph. 
in a factory graph, the joint probability distribution is written as a product of factors. Um, so just like this, this is a normalizing constant Z. And the notation S sub J denotes a subset of the variables um, which participate in factor FJ. Okay. Um, so the way we draw factor graphs is we draw open circles for each variable in the distribution and we draw filled dots, these little squares, for each factor in the distribution. Okay. So what do I mean by factor? Let me be completely clear about that. Let's create a very simple factor graph. Okay. Okay, factor graph. Um, so imagine I had three variables uh, that are binary. So A, B, and C are all elements of 0, 1. Okay. Now, a joint distribution over these three variables has how many parameters in it? Somebody, somebody from that side of the room. How many parameters are in a joint distribution over three binary variables in general? Eight? Almost seven. Seven is a good answer. Okay, so um, it's a, you can, if you have two binary variables, you have four choices, but you only have three parameters because the sum uh, of all of those four numbers has to equal one. If you have uh, three binary variables, let's draw it like a cube. Okay, let's say this is A, B, and C. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. You have eight different choices in your cube, and those eight numbers have to sum to one, so you have seven parameters. Okay. Now, imagine I told you that the do joint distribution of A, B, and C factors in the following way, according to this factor graph. Now, what does this mean? Is there, can somebody tell me an independent statement in this factor graph? Conditional independence statement. A is independent of C, conditional of B. This means, this implies A is independent of C conditioned on B. So not all sets of seven numbers in this cube satisfy that conditional independence relationship, right? So uh, these factor graphs. Um, can be represented as products of factors. So what do I mean by a factor? So this has two factors, F1 and F2. So this says that the joint distribution of A, B, and C is equal to 1 over Z, F1 of A, B, F2 of B, C. OK? So what is F1 of A, B? Can somebody tell me what that is? Not the values, but what, what, you know, we don't know what the values are. What kind of data object is that? A two by two matrix, okay? F1 of AB is a function of two variables. These two variables happen to be binary. So a function of two binary variables can be represented as a two by two array, right? And moreover, what, the, what kind of property does this function have to have? Non-negative. Okay, so F1 of AB is a two by two array of non-negative numbers. They don't have to be summing to one because the normalization constant will take care of that later. 
So these two numbers might be something, these, this two by two array might be something like 7, 0, 0.1, um, 2. Okay, that's a valid choice for F1. Okay, if F1 looked like that, what would, um, can you tell me something that that's representing? It's an unnormalized joint distribution over A and B. So tell me in words something this is telling me. Right? Then, you know, what is this? It's the, the numbers are 7, 0, 0.1, and 2. Yeah. So one of the things it's telling me is that the combination of A and B being both 0 is much more probable than anything else. Right? So it's telling me some compatibility between A and B. A and B both like to be 0, but it's also telling me that it is impossible, logically impossible, for A to be 0 and B to be 1, right? Because of this 0 in the matrix. So first of all, we can do anything we can do in logic, essentially, um, you know, with a finite set of variables, we can do with a graphical model like this just by putting in the logical constraints. But also, um, no matter what the other factors are, the zero doesn't go away. If you multiply zero by other things, it still stays a zero. The seven might get influenced by what's in this factor. Right? So these functions in the factor graph are, in the discrete case, they're tables. In the continuous case, there would be other kinds of functions. Maybe they would be unnormalized Gaussians or something like that. OK. So um, that's the factor graph. And now what we're going to do is we're going to propagate messages on a factor graph. So um, we have uh, the definition of a factor graph. So here is the propagation of messages. It's very simple. It's so simple that essentially I've written the, the whole thing on one slide. But of course, it takes um, you know, a while to understand what's happening. Okay. So here's the idea, just for notation. Let n of x denote the set of factor nodes that are neighbors of uh, variable x. And let n of f denote the set of variable nodes that are neighbors of factor f. Okay? So, um, F1 is neighbors with A and B. So factor 1 is neighbors with A and B. Variable B is neighbors with factor 1 and factor 2. Okay, it's a bipartite graph. Uh, factor <coughs> nodes are neighbors with variable nodes and vice versa. And there's no connections directly between factors or variables. So there are two kinds of messages. And if we send these two kinds of messages, then we can compute any probability we're interested in. So we can co compute probabilities in a factor graph by propagating messages from variables to factors and vice versa. So what are the two messages? Um, uh, the message from variable x to factor f looks like this, the message from variable x to factor f is a function of variable x, OK? So if x is binary, what does this thing look like? Sorry? A 2 by 1. This is, if, the, if x is binary, a function of uh, a binary variable is just a 2 by 1 vector. So the messages being sent on this graph are going to be these little vectors. Um, of different sizes, maybe, for d in the discrete case. So the message from variable x to factor f is a 2 by 1 vector, and it, it is obtained by multiplying together for all the factors that are neighbors of variable x, but not including factor f, so subtracting out factor f, all of the messages of the other factors, h, sent to x. So essentially, 
uh, let's consider, you know, this case here maybe. The message variable b sends to factor f2 is the product of all the messages all the other factors are sending to b. And the only other factor is f1. So you just take the message f1 is sending to b, and then you send that to f2. Okay? So it's a very simple message in that case. In, my, in other situations, if you had another factor f3 that was connected to some other variables here, you would be taking the messages coming in from f1 and f3, multiplying them together and sending them to f2. Okay? So that part is very easy. Now the message from factor f to variable x is uh, obtained in the following way. Again, it's a function of variable x, so it might be a 2 by 1 vector for binary variable x. And it's the sum over all the other variables x, not including um, little x, that factor f depends on of whatever is in factor f. For example, factor f might be a 2 by 2 table times the product of all the messages uh, from other variables y to f. All right, so you basically, if you're trying to compute a message from a factor to a variable, uh, what you do is you take the messages from other variables to that factor, that's uh, this term here, then you multiply them in by whatever function is in that factor. Then you sum out all the variables here and here that are not the variable that you're sending the message to. And then that's the message that you sent to um, this variable here, b. Okay. So it sounds a little complicated, but it's something you can write in, um, in one line here. And it's something that you can implement in you know, just several lines of code as well. Okay. Then we'll see an example of this in a couple of minutes, I think. Um, let me see. If, uh, let's go through the, the general background, and then, then I'll run through a couple of examples of this. Okay, so you can get a better intuition. And I'll show you an application of this to ranking, which is sort of an interesting application. All right, so this is what I just showed you, the messages from variables to factors, the messages from factors to variables. Um, and I've just repeated that information on this slide. Now, if a variable has only one factor as a neighbor, it can initiate message propagation. So for example, variable A has only one factor as a neighbor, so this variable can immediately send its message to this factor. Okay? And then that initiates message propagation. Um, so now once a variable has received all messages from its neighboring factor nodes, one can compute the probability of that variable by multiplying all the messages and renormalizing. Okay, so um, if I want to compute the probability of some variable x, I take all the messages, consider this variable b here, if I want to take, compute the probability of variable b, I take all the messages f1, f3, and f2 are sending to b. I multiply those. Those are all functions of, um, of b. I element-wise multiply those functions, and I renormalize, and that is my distribution of, over b. Okay? Now, um, Now, if I'm conditioning on something, let's say I take a factor f like this and I condition on the value c equals uh, some value c, <coughs> then that corresponds to um, essentially, uh, you know, you, ch you change. Oh, you, there's several ways of doing that. They're all equivalent, but one of them is to think about a factor that basically looks like 0 and 1 that sets the value 
of c to be a particular value, and you can add that into this and then do factor graph propagation on the new graph like that. Or you can change the factor coming out of c to eliminate one of the rows of that matrix corresponding to um, you know, the other values that c is not taking. So um, you don't have to iterate this. If your graph is a tree, you just send all the messages uh, in one direction and in the other direction, and you're done. Then you've computed all the marginal probabilities that you're interested in. So where does factor graph propagation come from? What do you think? How would we derive factor graph propagation? I'm just going to wash my hands briefly. Anybody? Dynamic programming, that's a good answer. Yes, it's, um, it's a kind of dynamic programming. Yeah. Um, what else went into, you know, where do these, these equations, they're derived from somewhere, right? Where do you think they come from? Physics. Physics. Uh, let's, uh, let's think. Huh? Harmonic energy, that would be very interesting. Possibly there are some ways of, uh, uh, of, of deriving them from other frameworks. And you know, certainly physicists are very clever, but I wouldn't attribute this to physicists. What basic rules of mathematics do you think you need to derive factor graph propagation? OK. Hint, what have I been saying at the beginning of these lectures? The, this stuff just comes from the sum rule and the product rule. Okay? I didn't need anything else. In fact, if I had you know, um, half an hour longer in this, in this lecture, I could derive these rules from you starting with three things. The sum rule, the product rule, and the definition of a factor graph. Okay? The definition of a factor graph is just this statement here. So the definition of the factor graph is basically the representation of the dependency in, in my knowledge. The sum rule and the product rule are just the two basic rules of probability. And then, you know, dynamic programming comes in in a sense because these things simplify, right? But dynamic programming isn't a new principle, it's just a way of simplifying more complicated things. And so this just comes from the sum rule and product rule. And unfortunately, you know, it would be way too slow for me to spend half an hour deriving it, but just trust me, you don't need any other piece of mathematics to derive this. So, and then that's nice because that gives you a kind of guarantee that whatever you're doing is following the basic rules of probability. Okay, and in fact, this factor graph propagation, some people call it um, the sum product algorithm, okay, because there's some there's sums and their products, but more fundamentally, because all they're doing is uh, applying the sum rule and the product rule. Okay. Um, now here is something you might have heard about um, that you might maybe even some of you have used. Uh, this is uh, a representation of a hidden Markov model as a graphical model. It's also the representation of a state space model, a kind of common filter type linear Gaussian state space model as a graphical model. And basically, the idea here is that you're trying to model some sequence of observations, x1 through xt, and you're trying to model it by assuming that it was generated from some sequence of hidden states, x1 through xt and that those hidden states follow some kind of Markovian dynamics, that x of t depends only on x of t minus 1 in this way. So there are many different ways of representing hidden Markov models and state space models. Here is a directed graphical model for it. Here is the factorization of the joint distribution corresponding to this directed graph. I could also write this as an undirected graph just by removing these arrow heads or as a factor graph just by adding little squares 
in here that would look visually almost the same. And here is the really interesting thing. Um, although in hidden Markov models, the states are discrete. In linear Gaussian state space models, the states are real valued Gaussian vectors. Um, you know, uh, very famous people like Kalman uh, derived Kalman filtering as an algorithm for linear Gaussian state space model, um, filtering in linear Gaussian state space models in the 1960s. Um, several people uh, in um, coding and signal processing derived the hidden Markov model forward backward algorithm also sometime in the 1960s. It turns out all of those algorithms are just special cases of factor graph propagation. Okay, so you don't need to, I mean when I was a, a when I was a graduate student unfortunately I spent two semesters uh, on common filtering. And actually, all I needed is, is one slide. And then somebody to tell me, just use these equations when it's Gaussian and linear. Okay. So uh, forward-backward algorithm and hidden Markov models and common smoothing algorithm, common filtering goes forward and common smoothing and combines that with the backward step are both instances of this factor graph propagation, sometimes called belief propagation algorithm. Okay? So that's also quite nice and links together some different fields. Okay. Now, um, of course, uh, we you know, don't want to have to re-implement all this stuff, so it's useful to know about some software that people use. So there are um, different uh, packages of software for graphical models, uh, some uh, historically widely used ones are things like bugs and win bugs. This is a software for graphical models where it's not doing factor graph propagation but it's doing Gibbs sampling on the graph. That's just another way of, of computing probabilities on the graph just by sampling from the variables given the other variables. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Then there is some software called Hugin, which is some widely used, and it focuses on exact inference in factor graphs. Um, there is uh, Kevin Murphy's BayesNet toolbox in MATLAB. There is a whole project at Microsoft called infer.net. There is a really nice software package called GMTK. And there are many, many more. I mean, these are just some examples of some that I know about and that I maybe have played with at some point. But uh, here is a list from Kevin Murphy's webpage of links to software packages, and this might be slightly out of date. But um, Kevin Murphy also has an excellent machine learning textbook where I think he talks about some of these things. So there's a lot of software out there for graphical models. Um, and just to summarize, uh, then we'll we summarize and then I'll talk about a particular application of graphical models which I think is interesting. So summarize inference. Inference consists of the problem of computing the probability distribution over variables of interest given the variables that you've observed. And for singly connected graphs uh, we have these factor graph propagation algorithms for solving things exactly. Common filtering and forward backward are special cases of this. For multiply connected graphs, which I haven't talked about, things with loops in them, then um, there are other approximate inference algorithms. There's an exact algorithm called junction tree, but that can be very slow. It can, in fact, take exponential time in certain cases. And there is um, a very nice algorithm called loopy belief propagation, which just applies factor graph propagation, ignoring the fact that the graph has loops. And that actually works very well in practice. Okay. So, um, let me now switch gears and talk about uh, an interesting application of graphical models. Okay, so this is an application to something called uh, probabilistic ranking. 
So let's think about something different. Let's think about um, games, okay? Games like, for example, the Olympics or chess or online games like, you know, Halo. Now, a lot of people play games and of all different kinds, and in games, you know, they're competitors, and, you know, sometimes somebody wins and somebody loses. And it's very natural to think about the question of how would you rank a bunch of different players in a game. Um, so we're going to focus on one particular example of just tennis players in men's single games. Just to keep things simple, the nice thing about tennis is you either win or lose. There is no draw. So that just keeps the mathematics a little bit simpler. And singles games is nice because you only have to consider the skill of one player. If you have a team game or doubles or something like that, you have to consider skills of multiple players. So that's why we're focusing on uh, tennis singles. And we're going to be interested in the question, what is the probability that player one um, defeats player two? Okay, Based on a bunch of games. That should be something we could answer. Now, uh, first of all, I want to just um, acknowledge that these are slides from the class that I teach with Carl Rasmussen. And actually, um, the credit for most of these slides goes to Carl Rasmussen and Joaquin Quinonero Candela, who um, taught this class with Carl and myself um, in a previous year. And um, interestingly, Joaquin actually now, uh, he worked at Microsoft for a while. He took a sabbatical from industry to come teach with us, which was kind of fun. It was a reversal of the role that a lot of people do. Um, he really enjoyed it, and he's a great teacher as well. And he's now working um, at Facebook doing a lot of the ranking that involves uh, things in Facebook. Okay. So he actually heads up the team there uh, that does a lot of the machine learning behind people's um, Facebook experience. Okay. So, um, so we're going to look at ranking. Now here is um, the, uh, the official way that the tennis sort of uh, the ATP, the Association of Tennis Professionals. This is the official ATP singles ranking from um, a year and a half ago, from this particular date. Okay, so here is the ranking of these players, where they're from, and the points that they had, and the number of tournaments played. Okay, so you can see uh, that uh, Djokovic had. 13,675 points, whatever that means, okay? Now, I mean, let's look at this. It's sort of nice, you know, it suggests that this guy is better than that guy, than Nadal. Nadal is maybe a little better than Federer. Okay, fine. But um, how did they compute this? Okay, so this is the ATP ranking explained to some degree. We can't explain all the details. It's the sum of points from the best 18 results in the past 52 weeks. Um, there are certain mandatory events for Grand Slams and eight Masters 1000 series events. And you, know, you use the best six results from the international events. Four of these might be 500 events. Somebody came up with these rules, right? This is the points breakdown for all the tournament categories. You know, um, there's a bunch of numbers in here, uh, et cetera. Grand Slams, you know, 2000, uh, et cetera. You know, winning finalists, semifinalists, quarterfinalists, et cetera. All right? And this is the, the particular um, choices of what are Grand Slams, what are Masters 1000 tournaments, et cetera. So, um, that's all fine, but it's not very satisfying, at least to me and you know, Carl and Joaquin. It doesn't seem very satisfying because it's very hard from these number of points to answer questions. And we're interested maybe in answering some questions. Let's say, for example, uh, you know, 
we wanted to know, is a player ranked higher than another one more likely to win? That should be a basic you know, requirement of a ranking system. And uh, you know, these differences are small. I don't know whether that means that Nadal versus Federer means that Nadal should beat Federer. Okay? Um, moreover, what is the probability from these numbers? We can't compute. What is the probability that Murray uh, defeats uh, Djokovic? Okay, we just know that the ranking of Djokovic is much higher than Murray. Does that mean the probability is 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001? We don't know, right? And practically speaking, you know, how much would you rationally bet on Murray in this game? You know, with odds of 1 to 3, 1 to 5? We can't tell from these numbers. Um, and there, there's some concerns as well about this ranking system. This point system ignores who you played against. Okay, you get points for ending up somewhere, but maybe you were pay playing somebody really good. Uh, and you lost, or maybe you were playing somebody really bad and you lost, right? That should be different. Um, and, and, you know, we're not really even, six out of the 18 tournaments don't need to be common to two players, so it's very hard to, you know, uh, combine these numbers that we're getting. So, uh, you know, obviously what I'm going to talk about doesn't relate just to tennis, but any way of ranking players in games. And in fact, it, this, what I'm going to talk about relates to uh, what Microsoft uses to rank all uh, players on Microsoft Live. So any, anyone, there's you know, several million people play, have Xboxes and they play games online. And whenever they play against other players, um, whenever they log in online, the system will suggest people that they can play against and that those choices are on the basis of a probabilistic ranking of players. The reason why Microsoft is interested in that is because if you play against somebody much better or more, much worse than you, you will be frustrated and you won't play as much. But if you're very well matched against other people, that game will be a lot of fun and you'll play more and spend more money, right? Okay, so it all comes down to money, sadly, but in the end, probabilistic ranking uh, is used by Microsoft to rank uh, every player on Xbox Live um, in real time. Okay, so how do we do this? Um, so let's consider building a reasonable system for ranking people. So here's what we're going to do. What we really want to know is what's a player's skill. So let's have a random variable. We're going to build a giant graphical model. Okay? And let's have a random variable for uh, the skill of every player at a particular game. So let's just build the giant graphical model for tennis. Okay? Um, now skills must be comparable. So the number that we have should represent uh, the idea that a, a player with higher skill is more likely to win. Okay? And now we want to do probabilistic inference of the player's skills because we don't observe the skill directly of a player. All we observe is the outcome of a game. You know, we observe uh, uh, Djokovic playing Nadal and Djokovic winning. That's all we observe. Okay? And now we also want to use our model to compute the probability of a game outcome. So if a new game happens, we want to be able to um, predict what is the probability that A wins against B. So here is a, a very simple model. It, this is a generative model for game outcome. We take two tennis players with skills. Let's assume skills are real numbers. So player one has skill W1, and player two has skill W2. All right? And then we uh, compute the difference between the skills of player one and player two. So let's call S the difference between W1 and W2. 
Now, it's not the case that the player with the highest skill always wins, right? Because every game uh, has a lot of randomness. You know, somebody's looking into the sun, is tired, injures themselves, you know, is uh, outside of their home country, is feeling kind of sad that day, whatever, okay? So, um, what we're going to take all of that variability and just model it with noise, okay? So we're going to say, um, take the difference in skills and add noise. And for simplicity, we can assume uh, zero mean noise with unit variance. The reason we can assume uh, zero mean just means that uh, there is symmetry in this problem. And we're not going to assume that the noise is going to favor uh, pl arbitrarily player one versus player two or the other way around. So that's where the zero mean comes from. Unit variance comes from the fact that we haven't told you anything about the scale of these variables. So without loss of generality, we can assume uh, unit variance. And that just gives you a scale for what these variables mean. The Gaussian assumption is arbitrary. <coughs> And we have to start somewhere. We could assume a different distribution here, and we would have a slightly different model. But we need to start somewhere, so we're going to assume Gaussian, because life is a little easier for Gaussian distributions. OK? So now, um, the uh, performance is going to be the skill plus some noise. That's the performance on that particular game. And the game outcome is going to be given simply by the sign of that performance variable. So y equals plus 1 means player 1 wins. y equals minus 1 means player 2 wins. OK? So this is our model. And that's it, basically. That's going to be our model. And now we can take uh, you know, a lot of data from games and try to infer the skills of different players with this model. Uh, so there are several ways of representing this model. This is a factor graph representation of our model. So uh, this is the skill of player one and player two as variables. And the priors are just going to be these, um, are, we need some representation of priors on these skills. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, distribution for the skills, we're also going to assume to be Gaussian for simplicity. And um, mu i and sigma i are the mean and standard deviation of the skill for player i. And so, uh, in fact, our goal is going to be to infer the skill distributions from data, so really to infer mu i and sigma i from observed game outcomes. Now, um, s is the skill difference, so there is a simple factor here that takes w1 and w2, subtracts them and gives s. This is a deterministic factor. Actually, it just implements that equation. Then T is um, a noise-corrupted version of S. Uh, from the previous slide, T is S plus some noise. So I'm going to represent that with another factor, H, that, that captures um, the relationship between T and S. So T is a, a Gaussian distribution with mean s and variance 1 from that noise that was added here. And um, uh, the outcome variable, the probability of outcome y, uh, given the um, t is just obtained by thresholding um, this variable here. So uh, y is just the sign of t. So that's another factor that relates the variable y to the variable t. That's also a deterministic factor. So you know, I've talked about probabilistic factors, but you can also 
incorporate deterministic factors in a factor graph. Okay? So that's y is the sine of t. Okay? So now, um, so the probability of outcome y, given known skills, if we were to know w1 and w2, we could then compute the probability of y given w1 and w2 by integrating over s and t using these equations. It's a double integral over s and t of the joint probability of s given w1 and w2 and then the probability of t given s and then the probability of y given t. Okay? Um, now, the posterior over skills, that's what we're kind of interested in learning. If we know the outcome for one particular game, then the posterior over the skills W1 and W2 is obtained by combining the priors, which we have here, uh, times uh, the likelihood, which is this thing that we computed here. Okay. Um, so here is just more detail on the likelihood. That's sort of not, not so important. Um, here is just a pictorial uh, representation of the likelihood. Um, <coughs> what we have here is the uh, area under this curve. This is a Gaussian with unit variance centered around the skill difference. The area under this curve uh, greater than zero is going to be the probability that player one wins. And the uh, complement of that, the area under the curve less than zero, is the probability that player two wins. That's just a re-representation using a picture of uh, the stuff that we showed with equations here. So obviously in this situation, you know, the skill, player two has higher skill than player one, right? That's why uh, the mean of this Gaussian is negative, because W2 is higher than W1, and that's why the probability of player two winning is higher than the probability of player one winning. Okay? So, um, you know, the, then, you know, you can work through some of the math here, uh, and I won't go into any detail on that, except that um, uh, if you're interested in this, essentially we have, uh, when, when we teach our graduate class in machine learning at Cambridge, um, we have a whole uh, exercise uh, with a bunch of like programming and so on, where you run through this data and this particular example, okay? And then you take the data from 2011 uh, and you run it through um, this factor graph. In fact, we have two parts to this exercise. We say uh, run it through this factor graph where um, we're going to deal with all the variables we don't know about using MCMC, using sampling, okay? And then do the same thing, but using factor graph propagation, okay? Which is a form of the EP algorithm, actually. So you have the same data and the same model, which looks like this, but it's much bigger than this because there is a variable like this for every game that's played. So there are several, several hundred of these, maybe some, several thousand of these variables, and several hundred players, or actually not that many, maybe, maybe a, a few dozen players and a few hundred games. So the data set consists of a few dozen players, a few hundred games, and um, the factor graph is sort of a replication of this where if a particular player plays in multiple games, then clearly you have to connect them up to all the games that he plays with. Uh, plays in, okay? And then we have an exercise where, you know, it's a programming exercise that will take a few hours to do where you implement basically the Gibbs sampler on this thing. It's mostly implemented, but you add a few lines to get the full implementation and you implement factor graph propagation and then you run it through this data and then you come up with a ranking of the players, 
and the ranking looks similar to this. Djokovic is still the highest skilled player for this period of time. Um, but now we have distributions on the skills, and now we can read from that model probabilities for any pair of games that we want, for any pair, a game between any pair of players that we want. Okay? And some of the rankings are actually different from the ATP rankings. You know, the order actually changes. And in that exercise, you can also compare, um, you know, what are the results if you run Gibbs sampling? What are the results if you run factor graph propagation on the same graph? How similar are they, or are they very different? Okay. So um, I'll stop here for today. But uh, if you're really interested, and if you really want to get intuition about how to do this on a real application with some real data, um, then I'll point you in the direction of that of that uh, exercise, and you know you can do it in groups or whatever at some point later. Okay. So we'll see you tomorrow then. Thank you.